Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Please take your seats. Uh, please feel warm welcome to continue our Russia seminar in these pleasant surroundings of Think Corner or Tiede Kulmas, as we say in Finnish. Uh, today it's been 245 days since the start of the Rus Russia's attack to Ukraine. These past eight months or so have had a devastating impact, not just in Ukraine, as we all know, but also on Russia and beyond. What we seem to witness today is not just a struggle about Ukraine's people, Ukraine's territory, Ukraine's political system or natural resources, but also about the nature of future European security architecture, and increasingly also a struggle about the survival of Vladimir Putin's regime. At the same time, this is also a major European disaster, if I may say so. In addition to intense war fighting and humanitarian crises, we have seen acts of sabotage, cyber strikes, food extortion, the use of energy supply as a weapon, as well as threats of the use of nuclear weapons, among other things. Europe has in many respects lost security because of this war. My dear friends, what we seek to do during the next 90 minutes in this roundtable is, is to address very difficult but a fundamental set of questions. How did we end up in this war? How should we understand its nature? And what this war means for Europe, Russia and the world? The questions, they are indeed daunting, but we, we have great company in assessing them. Let me introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. First, we have Roy Allison. He is the professor of Russian and Eurasian International Relations and the director of Russian and Euro Eurasian Studies Center at the University of Oxford. He has broad research interests in the international relations as well as foreign and security policies of Russia and Eurasia. Roy, if I may bother you, the first question to you what would you like to say as your opening remarks to this topic as you see it, please? So, thank you, thank you very much, Tommy. I'm delighted to be here in this uh, wonderful, informal, conversational environment. I think it's very good for a, a conversation, essentially, between us and with the audience mm. on these very consequential matters. Um, I, I'd just like to make a, a few points about the, the road to, to, to war the and the consequences of this. I mean, the points and questions, a few markers, what we should think about. Uh, I won't offer any answers probably in, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, the, the first, I think, is to point out that at its heart, this, this hasn't been a division between some so-called collective West and some alternative normative order of Russia, China, uh, and certain other states in the non-Western world. In annexing Crimea, uh, attacking Ukraine, and taking the extreme step of and, and, and annexing further uh, Donbas uh, republics, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Russia's most directly, and with hardly any disguise, uh, been challenging the absolutely core global United Nations Security Council Charter prohibition against territorial expansion through the use of force. And indeed, Putin's aimed at the destruction of the Ukrainian statehood itself. It's an outcome which we could describe as state death. Now we have to ask if Russia's shifted fundamentally from some acceptance of what we could say the power of international rules to reliance on the rule of power and military force, at least to the extent of its military reach. So that's the first point I want to make. Secondly, uh, with the collapse of Russian respect for rules, we have to ask how this challenges the post-Cold War territorial settlement in Europe, point alluded to by the chairman. The security policy principles of that settlement. What about the 1990 pa Paris Charter for a new Europe? Or indeed before that, the 1975 CSCE Conference Helsinki Final Act, which codified respect for borders, territorial integrity, and the means to constrain military actions. I mean, what remains of the organizational logic of the OSCE? Third, uh, where 
and what, how should we think about the role of identity? Uh, this is something that academics discuss uh, uh, extensively in, 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 in analyzing this part of the world. How far are Putin's actions driven by some peculiar rationale based on the idea of Russia's civilizational distinctiveness? It's a supposedly distinct civilization, uh, but one occupying a common territorial space with Ukraine, as it's now presented, and then being used to justify the, the subjugation of Ukraine on, on the grounds of historic justice and reclaiming Russia's historic regions. Um, does this language express Putin's real beliefs, perhaps his underlying thinking on Ukraine, confirmed and, and developed a pseudo-historical discourse by his uh, court historian, uh, Vladimir Medinsky? Or is this rhetoric largely instrumental, driven as to, to rally domestic opinion, national support among the public and elites for a war that's largely driven by strategic calculations? But that's a, that's a big open question. Fourth, there's certain strategic implications, and they're big ones, and I think we'll discuss those here, and I'll just touch on two. Uh, there is a nuclear dimension, I won't develop that, but we've seen that the Russian, Russian forces, conventional forces, have been significantly degraded, and Russia's conventional capability as a result. So my question here is whether Russia will therefore rely much more on asymmetric means, tools, to project power and influence in the years ahead, beyond the CIS and its near periphery, into, into Europe and beyond? And how can conventional diplomacy respond to this? And the whole issue of deniable uh, or grey zone actions. I mean, those were chosen by Russia in the past, partly to avoid the risk or to reduce the risk of escalation through direct coercion. But since February, and perhaps arguably before, Russia's claimed it's directly in some kind of proxy war with Western states, with Ukraine offering its territory to the United States and NATO as a theatre of engagement. So the question is, does this lower the need or threshold for deniability in Moscow? Will Russia engage in more blatant and attributable actions uh, beyond Ukraine? And we've seen some examples of that. And the final point I want to make or raise is, what are the implications of all of this for diplomacy as such in Russian policy with European states? when trust in Russia's commitment to treaties and agreements is hanging by a thread, if not completely broken. Russia's egregious violations of international humanitarian law only compound this, all of this which Moscow blandly denies. It's an additional factor destroying the potential for diplomacy. So how then can one conceive of an eventual negotiated settlement of the war, even if the two parties were to resume that track? How could, it, how could it ensure a sovereign, independent Ukraine when trust in treaties has been destroyed? And finally, um, if diplomacy in Europe with Russia does look more like realpolitik, which is perhaps what I'm driving towards, how can European states maintain working relations with Russia on wider multilateral or global issues, from climate change to Arctic exploration to the regimes on non-proliferation or the spread of missile technology. There is a wider agenda. How is that to be sustained? So, I mean, in conclusion, I think the European order uh, depended greatly on certain central post-Cold War principles, norms, understandings. And these will have to be replaced, or are being replaced, by some other way of living, some modus vivendi with Russia, managing relations with this increasingly militaristic state. But that militarism at the moment looks like it's becoming entrenched. And that's a very serious matter for us all. Thank you so much, Roy. You, you indeed raised a number of points that I think we will return during this discussion later on. It's great to have you with us. Uh, moving on in alphabetical order, our second panelist is Margarita Balmaceda. Uh, she is the Professor of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University and associate at the Harvard, Uni Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. In addition, Margarita heads the study group on energy materiality, infrastructure, speciality and power at the Hanse Wissenschaftskolleg in Germany. Her research focuses on the connections between natural resources, international relationships and political development with a special expertise in, in energy politics. 
Margarita, the same question to you. How, how would you read the big picture in, in the, at the Ukrainian war? Please. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and also for allowing us to have this important conversation in this very inspires, inspiring space. This is really a perfect space for this discussion. Um, I'd like to perhaps make one framing point and then raise two challenges for us to think about. Uh, the framing point uh, relates to one of the questions you raised. How did Europe sleepwalk? Or how mm. did we sleepwalk into this war? Well, we, we sleepwalk into this war through two things. First, through the very deep enmeshment of a whole set, a whole variety of actors within Europe, and in particular within Germany, interested and benefiting from a certain type of relations with Russia. I study energy uh, in, in the book I published last year, Russian Energy Chains, I talk about threat and temptation as two sides of participation in those Russian energy chains. And the reality is that for many, many actors, including in Ukraine, which is the, the country I study more specifically, participation in that chain of Russian energy exports brought not only the threat that we often saw or sometimes in headlines, not only the threat that was instrumentalized by some political leaders to conceal other things, but there was also a lot of opportunity, a lot of potentiality, a lot of opportunity for making profits. Let's look only at the members of the Nord Stream Consortium, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. There was a lot of opportunity for personal gain. Let's look at the role of Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. But there was even opportunity for groups um, ostensibly calling for the energy transition, which conveniently went through Russian gas as a good bridge fuel to move from the dirty world of coal to a bright future of decarbonization. So this kind of relationship with Russia that ended up making countries <laughs> like Germany utterly dependent on an economic relationship with the country is something that we need to assess, we need to understand. And as we look at the collective mea culpa of many actors today, we also have to see, well, how deep is this mea culpa and how far are we from perhaps some actors saying, after the war, let's return to that relationship. I am in Germany now. Every Monday there are demonstrations in Germany, including in the city where I'm living, in Potsdam. Many people are calling for some return to those relationships. So let's look at that. We also sleepwalked into this war through our ability to put into a corner, perhaps not into the think corner, but into a corner, the reality of Russia's 2014 invasion of Ukraine. The war did not start on February 24th. Of course, it started in its level of cruelty and its, in its um, totality at that date, but Russia had invaded Ukraine uh, eight years ago. Russia had, against international law, sought to establish control over Ukrainian territory. How come European actors manage to just put this into a corner and continue relations as if nothing had happened? How come energy dependence on Russia actually increased after 2014? In, in my book, I study oil, natural gas, coal. In each of these three commodities, dependence increased. Um, the second point I want to make, the second and third points are things for us to think about and kind of challenges. Uh, one is very short, and that is the challenge of reconciling two different visions of this conflict or this war. Um, some people, uh, especially those who can be seen perhaps as apologetic of Russia's role, see this as a conflict between Russia and NATO. Um, whereas some people, including myself, understand at the root of this situation Putin's, and some would say the Russian leaderships, or some would even go even farther, desire to exterminate Ukraine, not only as a state, but exterminate the, Russia, the Ukrainian nation. How do we conciliate these two versions? Can we understand that what is at the basis of the Russian attack on Ukraine is the desire to free the territory from the Ukrainian nation, but still understand the consequences for NATO? How can we understand that duality without falling 
into an apology of Russian's actions. And finally, I would like to flag a topic that perhaps somewhat exceeds uh, our panel today, but it's really important. And that has to do about the future of Russian and post-Soviet studies. I live in the United States. Many of my Ukrainian colleagues and members of the Ukrainian studies community are calling for a total rethinking of Slavic studies in the US. Sometimes I feel they go too far. I feel we will continue to need <laughs> to study Russia. Yes, we cannot just have Ukrainian literature and Ukrainian language and Ukrainian politics, but we will need to study Russia in a different way. Because this war is not only seeking to destroy Ukraine, it is also very deeply shaking Russia and perhaps destroying Russia as we know it. Um, I hope that in the course of our further conversation, we can talk about some of the effects of this war of choice on Russia itself, how it is unveiling tensions and weaknesses within Russia itself, and how it is creating challenges for the future in how we study and also how do we deal with that landmass, which now we call the Russian Federation, but perhaps maybe call something else in the future. So I leave it at this and hope we can continue a good discussion. Thank you so much, Margarita. Let's indeed do that, do that as, far, as far as we have time to do, to do so. Um, thank you so much. Great to have you with, with us as, as, as well. Uh, finally, we have Carolina vendil Pallin. Carolina is the uh, research director of the Russia program at the Swedish Defense Research Agency, FOI, a very highly appreciated institu institute on, on Russia, indeed. Uh, Carolina's research interests cover Russia's security political decision-making, uh, Russia's domestic politics, military reform in Russia, cyber strategy, as well as Russia-EU relationship. Carolina, the same question for you, or the same request for you. How do you see this picture? Please. Well, thank you. First of all, let me join the, the panelists in, in thanking for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I think the hallmark of a really good conference is the fact that you're constantly change, uh, changing your notes, what you're going to say <laughs> as you go along, and I've certainly done so uh, during this panel and during the, the conference as a whole. So, I think we tend to focus on the 24th of February, and, and I think Margarita was perfectly right. You, you pointed out that the, the war actually started in 2014. But nevertheless, I think many of us we will remember exactly where we were on the 24th of February this year, when we were reached by the news that Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but I would like to applaud the organizers of this panel for naming it the road to war, because I think it's essential that we go back and understand the decision. It didn't originate on the 24th of February, or even with the bizarre uh, meeting in the Security Council on the 21st of February. So one of my points will be that Russian decision-making has degenerated uh, considerably. Uh, it is not as if I'm saying that Russia has a, a good governance system, uh, but, uh, but certainly Russia has been able, at least when it comes to security policy, to, um, to have a rather well-oiled machinery and uh, uh, played a rather weak hand skillfully, I would say, and there's been consistency in the strategic goals, certainly from the mid-1990s. And now we find ourselves in a position where everything centered very much on, on Putin's civilizational war, uh, which Roy um, mentioned, um, the question of identity. A civilizational war against the West. Uh, and this also brings me to the necessity to, to highlight the very close um, interaction between domestic politics in Russia and its external security policy. Uh, because this is very much about the survival of Putin's political system as well. Um, now, if I'm right in my analysis, uh, then this has consequences for how we go about analyzing the conflict or in Slavic studies for the future. Uh, but if we backtrack, when was this de decision taken? Well, actually, the military buildup started um, to, um, uh, along the borders of Ukraine already in April 2021. Now, if you have to take the decision to, um, to do this, then probably, 
you know, we have to backtrack a couple of months more. So we're maybe late 2020, early 20, 2021. What had happened just before? Uh, we had the protest in Belarus in the summer and autumn of 2020. Uh, I think this could have been a triggering factor. And then in January this year, we had the protest in Kazakhstan. I would suggest that this, um, this highlighted Russia's fear of an orange revolution, as it were, or a color revolution in its neighborhood, but also inside Russia. These two are always interconnected. Um, so they saw this as a, a threat towards, to Russia's world, the Russian world, but also to Russia proper and Putin's political system. Um, the, the first lecture that we heard this, uh, yesterday was um, Professor Sarakos. And one of the things she said that empires have a long life. Well, you, you know, you, you could add to that that empires rarely disappear peacefully. We applauded ourselves on how peaceful the dissolution of the Soviet Union was, but maybe if we're witnessing the continuation of the breakup of a Russian empire, well, then this war, I would suggest, becomes an attempt to fix a broken egg. Um, and just to go out on a limb, I will suggest that this decision on the 24th of February, or whenever it was taken, I think we will be able also to analyze it as an example of folly in political decision making. And I'm, of course, uh, inspired by Barbara Tuckman and her book, March of Folly. Um, and, and one of the quotes that she has when, when, uh, when London decided to send a military force to, to um, the American colonies is Wal uh, Horace Walpole, he said that in a letter, it is that kind of war in which even a victory will ruin us. And I think this, is, um, this ties into Margarita's point um, about how the consequences, how very large they could be for Russia as a political polity as well and as a country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, much, Carolina. A number of very topical and uh, fundamental insi insights in, in, indeed. So thank you all, all three for these initial, initial comments. The rest of the program for this roundtable is, is quite simple. We'll next proceed to have a few prepared questions by, by me for the, for the panel, and after that there will be an opportunity for interaction between you and those of you who uh, follow this dis discussion live stream. Those who uh, follow this from uh, live stream can use the chat, chat option, and uh, for those of you present here, a microphone will be, will be prov provided after, after our, our, our next, next part of, the, of this discussion. Uh, my name is Tommy Koivula. I work as the professor of uh, strategy at the Finnish National Defense University here in Helsinki, and I, I have the privilege to serve as the chair of this uh, panel. Welcome all aboard. Um, okay, dear friends, the road to war has already been covered in your in each each of you your your addresses, and you have touched upon the theme on how how did we end up in this situation? Indeed, and. It has already been raised in this discussion, the, uh, this idea of sleepwalking into this, into this war. Indeed, what I'd like to discuss maybe in, in more detail, if you, if you want to, is indeed this metaphor of sleepwalking. So how, to what extent are we talking about unintended consequences of deeds, acts by policymakers in Russia or in the West, when we are talking about the emergence of the Ukrainian war. To what extent has this, has, has, has this been unintended? To what extent this has been something that was, you know, strive, strive for? How would you see this? Where is the balance between intention and unintended dimensions? Roy, how would you say this? I don't really favor this, uh, this image of sleepwalking. Uh, it, it, the the intention is really to look, stand back and to consider a, a spectrum of responsibility and, and blame, to, to, to dilute it. 
I think that, that there's, there's been a, a tendency, and uh, you find this in, in seeking to explain many major events. Uh, take, it's often used, for example, in the Western intervention in Libya, uh, that the consequences which you see are dire uh, were, in some sense, an automatic consequence of the initial action. But there were different points, forks in the road. There were political actions and decisions at various times. And it was the, those decisions that led in one direction rather than another, eventually leading to a bad outcome. And I think the same is true in this case. So to have some, to look sort of deterministically back, there's a path that you trace back, and that was, that was what necessarily would have ensued from, let's say, three, four years past. I think that's a false way of reading this. Uh, in fact, I'd go so far as to say that I don't think that Putin had a decided fully on the extent and scale of this until quite late. Uh, and that this all helps explain why he was prepared to spend hours in entertaining guests like President Macron and Schultz mm -hmm. in his long conversations. He wasn't interested in discussing the details of the Normandy process or whether or how Macron thought Ukrainians view of Minsk, all of this. This was long past. In my interpretation, he was really gauging the kind of response of these major European leaders to what he had in mind about various scales of major intervention in Ukraine and came away with the view, actually, there wouldn't be much coordinated, strong response, which fed into his decision about the scale of attack which he had in mind. And I think that in, internally within Russia, there's a process of justifying the action as well. And I, I don't have any, any clear direct evidence of this, but my, my feeling is that, for example, with a military command, there are major military strategic prizes to be gained from this uh, mirage, perhaps, of a full occupation of Ukrainian territory. And that's the way it was sold to the military command just as what happened after 2014 with Crimea. Within weeks, all those old plans on reanimating and building up the Soviet-era bases were brought out publicly. We knew, and of course, it went ahead like that. So this, 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 this was... So, I mean, I mean to, to conclude, I, th I think that until quite late, um, there, there were certain options. The other option clearly would have been a, a, a military control of the Donbass Republic's full and potential annexation there with the future option that that gives of a move in the Odessa direction, but without that actually having been fixed yet. Um, it would have been dependent on the Kiev Act. Um, so I, I'm not quite to answer it, but I think, I think it's, just, it's a methodological issue about how we, how we look about you know, determination and, and, and decisions, um, because so much does depend in that system now on the thinking of one man, much more so than earlier major acts of Russian policy, uh, where there was something, it was much, it was relatively more fluid, uh, and, uh, or even, you say, in the Soviet period, when there was some more collectivity. We know all about the decision to intervene in Afghanistan. We know the Politburo records, exactly what was said. The Central Committee discussions, they're all declassified. It wasn't just Brezhnev <laughs> imposing it. Actually, in that case, it was more Andropov the security services, but that's, a, <laughs> that's another you know, discussion. Thank you. Care to comment, uh, you, you ladies? Mm. I just want to follow up on, on, on one element here. Um, I agree with some of the limitations of this sleepwalking uh, or unintended consequences uh, analogy, but I do think that we need to look at the way in which those actions, those comments, you're referring to those conversations between Putin and, and Western European leaders, how that gave a certain confidence to Putin about yeah. what could be the, the responses. Um, I also think that the, his reading of the situation in Germany after uh, Angela Merkel's um, retiring from office, the idea of the weakness in the coalition gave him a lot of ideas about what he could get ahead away with. Um, so I think that is uh, something that we also need to keep in mind. Um, I also want to follow up on another point you made about the quality of decision making and decision making by one person now by Putin. Um, I think this is very interesting because sometimes I wonder whether some restraint 
may eventually come from the military because what Putin is doing is also destroying whatever attempt there was at a reform of the Russian military. So um, maybe we can follow up on this uh, later on, but I think this, this question of the quality of leadership and how even for the Russian leadership, for Putin himself, the events on the ground have overtaken his calculations. I think this is also a very important uh, element. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just um, first of all, when I do my backtracking, I'm not saying that the decision was exactly the one that it, we actually saw, but I think the decision to do something, that's what I'm trying to backtrack. Um, and I, I would also take issue a bit with this uh, sleepwalking um, argument. Um, actually, I, I think w what we witnessed was a string of, of uh, delusions that lay behind um, the decision in Moscow. Uh, first of all, they overestimated the ability of Russia's armed forces. Um, typically, um, countries are very poor at um, learning from military victories. They learn from military defeats, and, and Russia had, had a victories or successes both in Syria and in Crimea, that's what they banked on, I think. Um, secondly, they underestimated Ukraine. Uh, they, they misread Ukraine uh, fatally. Uh, I mean, war changes countries, and, and Ukraine had been in, in a war since 2014. Uh, they misread the West. Um, I think this is also... Um, w w when you read what uh, Putin was saying about the West, how degenerate the, the West is and, and how weak the West is. I mean, he probably undermined uh, the West's ability to unite. I think also um, perhaps an underestimation of how deeply integrated Russia was in the world economy. All this talk about sovereignty. Uh, but Russia is deeply integrated or was in, in the world economy and supply chains and all that. And of course, an, an, another reason why I, I would say that this is a ruinous war for, for Russia is, I mean, they had a, a very good position when it came to energy. I mean, the, this, is, this has been an, an important income and it is, still is. But in, in the longer term perspective, um, at least in my reading, I mean, this is a question for Margarita ultimately. This must damage that one of their main incomes, their, the golden egg, so to speak. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, this, what, what each of you have, have said raises the question, at least in my mind, on how can we understand Russian leadership, or how can we understand Putin's behavior and Putin's choices? How can we understand them? Uh, do we live... Do we, in, in, in the same world? Do we live in different worlds? How, how, how do you see this? Is there a, is there a fundamental difference in, in a way which Russia and, and us, us Westerners understand security or nation, national interests? Who would like to comment or care to comment on this? Yeah. May I just Please. add, say one, I just want to quote something um, that Caroline mentioned a moment ago about uh, from yesterday's panel, how empires don't usually disappear quietly or don't disappear easily. I think you need to understand that as a background mm. to everything we are seeing. Yeah. And you also need to understand not only that legacy of hundreds of years, but also the way in which in the last 10 years, Putin's power within Russia has been consolidating and coming, making actors at all levels, including governors, including yeah. other uh, officials, directly responsible to him and depending on his own popularity and success. And that combination, in my view, is key for understanding that difference in views about the situation. Yeah, right. Uh, others, get a comment? On so so I, I think it's one should broaden it out a little bit. It, I mean, Putin is uh, the, the, key, the key actor, but I think it, he shares a mentality and mindset with others. Of course, he's drawn them into the political system. Uh, those he relies on very heavily and listens to. I mean, key among these, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, uh, people like Bortnikov. Um, in the past, it was Sergei Ivanov, not, 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 not so much now. 
you have a group of those with a, a particular, uh, a, a, a quite a polarized mindset of, of the way in which the world works and the, uh, Rus the way that other countries' intentions towards Russia. Uh, and this has become entrenched, uh, it seems to me, uh, and in some ways simplified. I mean, if, you, if you read the Patrushev, it is, it is a very Manichaean world. Uh, and that goes with a, a, a thinking there you find in the general staff that in a way that, that a big war is inevitable. I mean, this has been there, you see in writings, going back quite a long way. Back to 2009, initially the smaller wars expected. The 2009 National Security Strategy talked about wars over resources around Russia's perimeter perimeters, so we thought mm. of more energy type wars, but there was also the view that in, later into the 2020s there would, a big war was pending and Russia had to prepare for that. Um, so this over years there make, makes, makes the, you, you find what you look for in, in some, some extent and I, I, so I, I think that this, this is a difference in, in me mentality. Uh, security, you know the idea of human security yeah. The United Nations concept and that which the liberal international order, pretty far from that mindset yeah. and that approach and, and the way the way that kind of thinking. Um, finally, the question of the role of history. I mean, the, this the instrument, is instrumentalization of history. I'm curious about this because if you look at Putin's the his article last uh, last summer uh, that he published. Now that of course was he didn't write this. Uh, but uh, he was interviewed soon afterwards, live, and it's clear he's absorbed a lot, he's internalized a lot of that thinking, including some of the, you know, the empirical claims, false empirical claims, and he's coming out with it. And it, it, I, I wonder whether he's, come, he's convinced himself that in 2014, in, when he gave a speech in Crimea about Russia's uh, historic, um, the historic justice, I, I'm not so sure he was convinced yet this is more about instrumentalizing and getting support. By 2022, perhaps he'd convinced himself of some of this, and that makes it the, the, more, the more worrying and challenging, you know, if, if, if there is some belief that drives this. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes yeah. me think of um, Margot Light's book on the theory of inter, uh, international relations, or the theory of Marxist Lenin, the role of Marxism-Leninism in, in uh, Soviet international relations, and uh, basically what she concludes is that, yes, uh, the Soviet Union used it to legi le legitimate uh, what they were doing. They were actually guided often by national interest. But she also says that it, it had this other role. I mean, if you're constantly um, explaining your decision-making to each other in a room in terms of Marxist-Leninism or in, in this case, the, in a civilizational war, you know, at some point it, it's going to also have consequences for how you speak and and ultimately what you do. Indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, now, as we look, look to the uh, unfolding of this war during the past eight, eight months or so, it seems that we have witnessed some kind of uh, blurring between war, war and peace, at least understood in the traditional sense, sense of these expressions. What we have seen is that uh, military and non-military means of uh, have, have been used for hostile action and destruction in this conflict. We, see, we have seen how interdependence has been used as a weapon. So the question to the panel is, are we witnessing some kind of paradigm change of, of security? And uh, if so, are the institutions in, in place, the security institutions in place, are we ready to cope with this paradigm change of, of security? Not an easy one, but uh, you are, you are the experts, so feel free. Yeah. This is your field, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was struck by how we, after 2014, we tried to invent a lot of new terms to describe what we were seeing. Mm. But I mean, in fact, uh, states have been combining different me measures um, for ages. It, it's usually what we call strategy or grand strategy. Um, wars are not um, waged just to wage a war. You have a political goal. And if, you can, if, if it becomes more likely that you're going to um, reach that goal, if you also put economic pressure on, on your opponents or, and, and uh, use 
information to uh, to um, confuse your opponent. I mean, of course, you're going to use that. Mm. I think we were just we were so unused to the idea of a war in in Europe, even though we'd had Georgia in, in uh, uh, 2008. Um, it was almost as if we were covering up for not having done our homework. Um, and so we invented a lot of new terms for what we were seeing. But, I mean, for me, it's strategy. You use the different tools at your disposal. Tom, there's one point on this I'd perhaps Please. bring, and that is, yeah. uh, and it's very delicate and you know, potentially worrying one, it is this whole question of what it is to be a party to a war. Yeah. Um, and it's different to be a legally a party to this war and to effectively politically in terms of how you proceed politically. Now legally, uh, Western states are not party uh, to the, a war against Russia at all. What they're doing is they are, they've joined the collective defense of Ukraine, which is permitted under international law because of the violation of its territorial integrity through an uh, illegal attack from outside, and they've permitted the measures necessary to do that. But politically, there are constraints mm -hmm. because of, I mean, when Russia talks, it's been, it talks at various times about uh, the United States being very close to being a party of the war, party to the war. You know, if it supplies missiles of such and such a range, then it will become party to the war. There isn't this kind of division. In, it is, there's sort of red lines that Russia is trying to, to advance, and they're being tested all the time politically. Yeah. Uh, there are no ground rules here. I mean, the ground rules, we the legality of it is, is not really at issue here. Mm. Uh, and it, this is incremental yeah. efforts of pushing and pushing. Right. And, you know, what is war and what is not. So it, engagement in the war, in what kind of engagement, is another dimension. In addition to what you referred to, Tommy, is, is all the uh, non-military aspects of coercion. Right, which are spilling over. Right. And of course, Russia still claims that it's not engaged in a war. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> right. Uh, Margarita, paradigm of security. How, how, what's your opinion on this? Well, I, I totally agree with the points made by, by Roy Allison. And I also think that we need to also accept the reality that this mm. is creating a huge challenge for our United Nations Security Council and the way we think about it. Yeah. Uh, we have a Security Council that cannot act because of Russia's role and veto power in it. And I think, um, I don't know when is the right time to reform it, but it's, it's, a, it's a major challenge. So let me leave it at that, and um, uh, hopefully we can look at it in another perspective later. Uh, good point. UN was mentioned. What about European Union, Na NATO? Um, are, the, uh, are those institutions ready? Tough one, maybe. Well, you, you, you may remember in the early 2000s, there was even the idea of a, a Russia-European Union Council, sort of a yeah. joint, and this was more, Russia was keener on that because it wanted to have some kind of veto <laughs> over <laughs> EU decision-making, which uh, new arrivals to the EU were not at all keen on. Um, and when it became clear that many of those efforts to try and draw Russia into engagement with the EU through some kind of institutional forms were all about Russia gaining a, a veto over. Oh. They didn't really progress. But now, um, I mean, that's all fallen away. The Russia-EU direct track, uh -huh. uh, including the energy dimension, which was the, what held it together in many ways, the trade, that itself has also fallen away. So now you have, it's, it, it's more a, a, a sort of adversarial relationship through sanctions and, and, and so forth. Uh, which uh, it means that we've, I mean, we've, crossed, we've crossed the Rubicon. I, 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 I've got, the European Union has a problem still in, understand, in, in thinking about how it's going to manage those states beyond its current membership zone. We've been discussing this at other panels. I mean, the Eastern Partnership states, that, that all those programs of action and so on, it's, they can't function in this environment. There still are the association agreements, right? Um, there's a certain framework, uh, uh, but, it, it, but, but they're, not, they're not accompanied by any Russia-EU track to 
to to find, manage ru ru Russian concerns about those countries. You know, there's it, there's a vacuum here. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving to maybe to now maybe to above all Margarita's domain, energy security. Of course, others will be more than welcome to address this as well, but. Uh, a question on energy security and military strategy, uh, or strategy in a more general sense. Has the relationship between energy security and strategy or military side, has, has the relationship changed because of this, or during, during this war of aggression? And uh, if it has, what can we still assume? What, what assumptions are, are still sort of valid in, in this present stage that energy markets and uh, new, all kinds of new developments seem, seem, to, seem to be taking place. So what has changed? What remains on, on energy security? <laughs> Please. Well, uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> I think what has changed is key actors understanding the real implications of uh -huh. their past actions. Okay. Um, Sincerely or not sincerely, I don't know, uh, acknowledging part of the blame for the situation. What has not changed is that there are still actors that have an interest in the Russian engagement, in the Russian market. Yeah. And if we do not acknowledge that, we are going to be condemned. <coughs> to see in this conflict uh, much longer. The first set of actors, they are not in the European Union, they are outside the European Union. If we in the European Union think that with a European Union embargo, which is anyway a partial embargo on Russian oil or even a um, collective uh, purchasing agreement or even a price cap, we are going to uh, reach anything when they are very important countries and markets for Russian oil eager to purchase that oil outside the European Union. If we do not consider that, we are diagnosing, diagnosing ourselves into failure. That's the first thing. Yeah. And the second thing is that there are still many players within European Union states which are interested in that relationship. You have energy traders um, that are kind of secondary traders in, in, in oil, in refined products, in, in gas, in other industrial products. You have companies that are investing in Russia and are still there. So let's not be too optimistic about the degree to which that disengagement has taken place. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, others care to comment on, on energy security issues? Not that well, I, I just, okay. I, I, yeah. one aspect of the, the sanctions regime uh, is the, um, it's already started after 2014, of course. It's on uh -huh. the technologies required for this deep sea drilling in the Arctic region. And Russia was increasingly reliant on uh, China and others' investment to try and replace it, which wasn't as adequate, as effective as what they, they could get from the West. Uh, now, that's, uh, that's even more impeded. Uh, so, so this is about... Uh, the, the, looking at it out of five, ten years ago, from the, the Russian perspective, the, the, the view of Russia as a, grand of, uh, a land of uh, endless riches, natural resources, which will sustain it, sustain the economy, whatever the current position, it has this to, to, to draw upon. Um, that vision is, is really put back on the back foot, rather. E and even Chinese are now reluctant to, to be as involved as they, they were planning to be because of the issues of secondary sanctions and so forth. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that, that sort of reinforces this, this problem of how uh -huh. to... How, you know, reliance on hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon economy. Right, thank you, thank you. If I may Please. add just one small thing. So normally, often when we think about energy security, we think about states. Yeah. Uh, in all the work I have done, I have tried to show that you have to look inside. And what is happening now in the European Union really shows us that this is true, because the key thing is going to be this winter and next winter, how these different European Union states manage the pain of the increased prices. And we're already seeing that different European Union countries are doing this differently, like Germany with its 200 uh, billion or whatever a package, other countries with other measures in a way that may actually end up dividing the European Union. So we need to look at what at energy security, not only at that 
level of states, but also in terms of how these different states are managing this pain, how there is a balance or not between managing that pain and the possible role of right-wing actors that are already rising in some of these states, and on the other hand, the impact that those measures may have on European Union cohesion on other, in other areas. So that's, I think, in my view, that is key. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, um, moving forward in, in, in the uh, manuscript of this discussion or the program of this dis discussion to the impact of, of this war or its meaning or significance. So, we have seen eight months of, of war. Nobody knows when it will end, but uh, when it will end, what will change? What will change in Russia? What will change in Ukraine? What will change in Europe? A very small question, as you can see. Please. Well, I can go first. Uh, I mean, one of the most common questions that I get when I'm talking um, is, you know, when will this war end? And mm. underlying that question is, is, you know, a wish or a question about when can we go back to how it was? Yeah. <laughs> and there's there's no going back. There's no normal to go back to, not in, in Russia, certainly not in Ukraine, but also, I think, within Europe and, and perhaps even wider. Uh, this war has changed things um, fundamentally. Um, I mean, since, since I'm an expert on, on Russia, I, I will talk about Russia. Um, Typically, in the national security strategy that was published in July 2021, you still had the overarching goal of an economic growth best based on a technological leap. This was an important uh, strategic goal for Russia, uh, a long-term goal, which has basically blown out the window um, this year. There is no way that Russia is going to uh, reach that goal. Um, and, and also, I mean, what has been underpinning um, uh, Russian strategic thinking, at least if you, if you read the official documents, is the need for a balance between socioeconomic development and national security uh, needs. And this balance has been, again, I mean, there was never a, an equal balance, I would say. National security goals would always win the day. Uh, when push come, came to show. But having said that, there was still that, um, that goal. And, and this, again, is, is completely blown out of the window because of the war. Um, there is no way uh, that Russia is going to have the, the kind of socioeconomic development that it uh, projected uh, a year ago. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I may uh, say just one thing following up on this, when you were talking about the social, the balancing of the socioeconomic and the strategic element, I think we really need to look at what this war of choice, and in particular this quote-unquote partial mobilization, is revealing about Russia itself. Mm. Um, what it is revealing about the continued uh, discrimination and imperial relationships within colonial relationships within Russia itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is going to be very important. You have a situation where those relationships are being made more open through the way in which this mobilization is um, being engaged in. You also have a situation where some of those areas that had been very conflictive in the past, such as the North Caucasus, and potentially Tatarstan and Bashkorkostan have been especially affected by this mobilization, you have an interface of that with the potential, as you mentioned a moment ago, about the destruction of markets and the destruction of income from fossil fuel exports. That's a very, potentially very problematic combination, mm -hmm. and that may lead to challenges to the status quo in Russia that we are not expecting. So we need to, yeah. to keep this in mind. Yeah, and if I can just add, I mean, we're for good reasons, we're discussing the, the, the risk of a horizontal uh, escalation of the war to, uh, to a nuclear war. Uh, 
which you know we want to um, avoid at all costs, of course, or almost all costs. But um, we perhaps focus less on the risk for a horizontal um, escalation of the war. Um, when, when Russia now needs its military resources in Ukraine, it's been reducing its military presence, for example, in Nagorno-Karabakh, where yeah. we've already seen um, fights erupting. Uh, we had uh, the border clashes between uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> Sometimes, when you, again, this question of when the war is over, you know, yeah. <laughs> what will we see? Well, well, maybe we'll see something very different from just an end to, to a war in Ukraine uh, in the future. Right. Thank you. Uh, Roy, please. What will change? Well, um, for a very, most of the period since the end of the Cold War, there's been this effort on both sides. It, some common language of overcoming dividing lines uh -huh. in Europe. Now, there have been way, institutional attempts to do that. Um, individual countries have played bigger roles. There were the EU had its various eastern dimension. There was the northern dimension. All of that, I think, is over. It seems to me now that these dividing lines will be deeply entrenched. They'll be entrenched in security terms, political terms, economic, normative terms. And this leaves a fundamental question about where the actual, the, first, the bit in the middle and where Ukraine lies in that, in that respect. Um, which is, I think the existential question for Ukraine remains, how is it going to survive as a state, even if it prevails in this war, manages to push Russian forces back from its territory? How can it survive outside alliance structures on the likely assumption, unfortunately, that I think NATO will not be there as a, um, We'll, w there will be countries in NATO that will simply will, will, will not ultimately accept it as a member. That's a big open question. Um, w with Europe, uh, I think that this signifies the end of some, I'd say, is, is it the end? I mean, the whole Ostpolitik, you know, from the late Cold War period, and that's reflected then in the energy relationships and the, the whole underlying strategic culture, if you like, of Germany, of, sort of never again, never again confrontation with Russia. Has that really been removed now, or how much is there left? I mean, I'm a slight uncertain about that. And as for France, has played always this role of the, the sort of Gaullist continental balancer. You need to have a relationship with Russia, France, in order to be able to, to, to limit overbearing influence of the United States and the transatlantic. And that, that surfaces president after president. It doesn't matter what their political complexion is. And I think it was there in Macron's diplomacy with, with Putin and so on. I, I think his, his attitude is shifting on this. Where the French underlying view, to some extent, I think, to some extent anyway. Um, a final point is, I think what Carolina mentioned is, and it links to the, the dividing lines. If, if there are these dividing lines, it becomes much more difficult to support the continued sovereign sovereignty, really, and, 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 and growth of those small countries on the other side. So I'm thinking of Moldova, which is acutely vulnerable. Uh, Georgia, which has played a very, very cautious game uh, over this war and earlier under uh, President Ivanishvili, um, but is very vulnerable. Uh, and then the uncertainty about other countries further in Central Asia that are, are at the moment are pushing back, rather, at Russia's uh, attempts to, uh, to talk again, once again ab about integration of the region. This, this happened at the later CIS Heads of State Council. Putin's language is very much a, a, a kind of deep integration. They're resisting that, but uh, you know, if they need, they'll need some support from outside. Kazakhstan might get it from China. It's an interesting thought. Recent language suggests that China's taken an active interest in, in the independence of those states. Thank you indeed. We surely seem to have a number of uh, ramifica ramifications to, to various, various directions because of, the, of this war. Uh, okay, dear friends, uh, let's now move on with the program. And this may